a question. She ran a hand through her midnight hair as she asked, adjusting some of what the night's light breeze had disheveled. Is there a difference, conceptually speaking, between love and duty? Talia did not cast a look over her shoulder to the servant that joined her upon the ridge overlooking the Badlands. The white fire of a full moon burned overhead, quickly snuffed out by a ribbon of clouds. A ship crawled the horizon, the low hum of its eight engines reaching them and filling the silence that came in the wake of the question. Talia gave her servant another moment to furnish a response, then turned to face him when no answer came. Her eyes, of a breed that had not graced this world in millennia, glowed the color of dying embers. The thin ribbon of clouds that had masked the moon now parted, revealing those eyes to be set upon skin as smooth and fair as ivory. Her cloak shrouded her lithe body preternaturally. It was more than mere cloth, an arcane weave whose secrets were lost to the relentless march of time. Only the past past knows knows the secrets secrets of a dead dead empire. empire. Behind Talia, the desolation that marked the eastern fringe of the Vostaver Empire was revealed once more by the pallor of the moon. An infinity of worthless tanned earth turned gray beneath the moonlight, shadowed only where that cruiser hovered above it. Talia smiled as she asked, Well, do you have an answer? Is duty not born from love? Her servant replied, trying to mask the pitiful hope in his eyes. He had forgotten himself. He had fallen in love with a being forever beyond his reach. And Talia had nothing but scorn for him. Your love is the brazen brazen dream of a dimwit. dimwit. I could just as easily argue the opposite, she replied, knowing in her heart it was the truth. This This wretched wretched man man knows nothing, nothing, Talon. Talon. Talia closed her eyes and pushed back the madness gnawing at her mind. No, No, I'm not not insane insane yet. yet. I'm still in love, still dutiful, even after three millennia. I am not insane yet. But then, you tell me what you think of love and duty. Her servant looked away, no doubt trying to hide the ambitions of the flesh that lurked in his gaze. I will not argue with you. Talia rolled her eyes. Weak. He must have sensed her displeasure. But for my duty and service, I was promised a reward. And rewarded you will be. Talia gave him the sincerest smile she could muster. It never met her eyes. Another happened upon them. Aramor, clad in mundane black as though a pale imitation of Talia, stalked into sight. She dropped to one knee next to the servant. Aramor was a creature of perfect discipline and obedience. She would not dare so much as speak without first being spoken to. Is it done? Talia asked. Arimor nodded and flourished a hand, purple flames dancing on her palm as she gestured to the Badlands beyond the ridge. Nothing of the patrols out there remains. It's just us and that cruiser. She flapped her hand shut, the small conflagration vanishing. Talia turned around, fixing her eyes back on the cruiser as another gust of wind stroked their overlook. That was the Eritaria, the new flagship of the Vostaver Armada. It resembled a trireme of a lesser civilization, only it hovered hundreds of feet in the air and would completely dwarf its sea-bound cousin. It was kept aloft by golden gemstones on her keel, four on each side. The knowledge of how such engines were made was lost to most civilizations. And yet yet these crafty crafty little little Voss are making works works like like that. that. How brazen. The Empress and Autark are aboard that vessel, Talia said. See to it they do not see morning's light. The servant bounced a gemstone on his palm. It flickered emerald light. He tapped a hand on Aramor's shoulder as they both said, As you command. Both vanished in a flash of dark green light, reappearing on the Eritaria as a distant glimmer. And then the fighting started. Talia drank the spectacle in, losing grip on her self-control. Shadows climbed up her legs and body, ensconcing her until only a silhouette with luminescent red eyes remained. Enjoy the beginning of the end, you naive, fearless bastards, she snickered. I know I am. Laughter cackled from the overlook as Eritaria began to combust with purple flames. Another flash of green appeared behind Talia, her servant and Aramor lingering after the light faded. Talia just barely managed to reassert control over herself as they arrived. Talia turned around as the glow began to fade from Eritaria's engines. That cruiser began to fall, 
hanging lower and lower until it came to the ground, tearing a long gash through the badlands and kicking up a thick column of dust. Very good, Talia said, although she landed softer than I expected. A sorcerer on board must have tried to break her fall. With the Empress dead and the Empire's command structure decapitated, a little game gets a bit easier. The Empire will recover, her servant said. Undoubtedly. At least, if this didn't occur following the assassinations in Tanalar and Erendar. Talia's smile was sour. Now the world balances upon a teetering precipice. I wonder what peace gives way first. You're going to start a war, the servant growled. I am, Talia said, turning back to the devastation while memories and voices chittered in the back of her mind. Love and duty demanded of me. Love and duty driving us all to do the damnedest things. Princess Marolina Caldron had spent the morning crying. Even now, as a half-dozen maids flitted about her, Marolina's eyes were still red, her cheeks still damp. A week ago had brought her news of her mother's death, delivered personally by first champion Cal Danarum. Each morning since had brought the grief on anew as though she hadn't spent the nights before crying herself to sleep. Mistress Kianara entered into the dressing chamber, dismissing the six others with but a wave of her hand. The head maid was not to be trifled with, not today of all days. She offered a slight curtsy, to which Marlena replied with a nod. Kianara stepped up closer, finishing the last few adjustments that her handmaidens had started. Even in your private chambers, princess, do not weep, Kianara said. Word will reach Fleet Master Schifrin, and the last we need is her scolding you on the morning of your coronation. She wouldn't dare scold her Empress, Marlena muttered, rubbing at her eyes. You aren't Empress yet, Mistress Kianara said, and even if you were, I sincerely doubt that would stop her. She pulled the last two strings together on Marlena's corset, and then announced, There, all done. Kianara guided Marlena over to a trio of standing mirrors arranged in a curve. Marlena's dress was mostly red, with thick bands of black accenting the skirt. There you go, nice and posh for your big day. You, you look, look good. good. Marlena whirled around as she felt the voice tickle her mind. Luiken Eferis stood leaning by the door with his arms crossed. Presumptuous of you to enter my chambers unannounced, Marlena hissed while Kianara shirked away. Shrugging, Luikin replied, It was decided I would be the one to escort you to the Hall of Stars. I would be a poor escort to let you out of my sight. Thank you for your assistance, Kianara, Marlena said while dismissing her head maid with a gesture of her hand. I'll attend to myself from here on. See to it all other preparations have been met. She fixed Luikin sternly, as sternly as she could manage for a man old enough to be her father. It was made slightly easier by the fact he looked younger than he was. And thank you for your offer, but my guardians, your guardians, are in agreement that I should be your escort, Luikin replied, while Kianara curtsied and departed. She kept a healthy distance from Luikin as she made for the door. Marlena could not fault her. Luikin was, perhaps, the most dangerous man in the Empire. The Dagger of the Vostaver, he was called. A weapon to be wielded by empresses to slay kings and queens. The attack that killed Mother could have just as easily have been your handiwork, Luigan. Marlena sighed. This was not how it was supposed to be. With all due respect, this wasn't how anything was supposed to go, Luigan countered. For a moment, Marlena thought she saw shame in Luigan's disarmingly youthful features. Be that as it may, he continued, his usual assertiveness returning. This is how things are. For the moment, we look weak. This coronation, then, will be the first step in granting ourselves strength once more. Marlena wanted to trust Luikin, but caution compelled her against it. Assassins like him had ended her mother's life. To trust one could prove folly, and if Luikin truly were that skilled, the attack would have been prevented. If Her Majesty is ready, then perhaps she should proceed with me to her carriage. The masses are waiting. With his telepathy, Luikin added, a day like today is not one to tarry. He gestured for her to follow. Unfortunately, I cannot disagree. Marlena followed him out the doorway. Beyond awaited four of her sixteen guardians, Captain Sayer amongst them. Each of her guardians wore golden armor that gleamed in day's light, 
helms molded to look like animals, forged not just by master smiths, but also warded by imperial sorcerers. Sayer's helm was that of the lion. The others were a serpent, ram, and lynx. Marlena proceeded through the halls of her private chambers with Luikin by her side, and her guardians arranged a diamond around her. Captain Sayer took the lead. There should have been eight guardians with her, but the attack had culled their number significantly. Sayer would have to spend months, perhaps years, to find adequate replacements. Marlena shuddered at the idea of going so long without her bodyguard at full strength. Of course, there's no guarantee they're capable of protecting me anyways. They couldn't even protect Mother. They brought her through her own chambers, through side passageways to the main entrance to the palace. Three tiers of stairs poured out onto the innermost city streets, their sides bracketed by ranks of imperial soldiers and palace guards. Behind those soldiers and out in the streets beyond were the throngs and throngs of citizens that had come to see the coronation. These were not just the people of Eder Vos, but of surrounding towns as well. Of course, this number was a poor showing compared to previous coronations. With but a week to prepare, news had not yet circulated to the whole of the Vostaver Empire. The bulk of the autocracy's officers were not in attendance, and neither were the dignitaries from foreign lands. Marlena's mother had told of her own coronation, of the streets being so packed that people had to watch from rooftops. Today, it looked like the soldiers from the army outnumbered the crowd. Why does this make me feel like I'm a prisoner to my own empire? Princess Marlena was guided to a carriage drawn by four horses. Luikin assisted her in climbing into it, then entered himself. The guardians formed a square, walking in sync as the carriage pulled into motion. A marching band heralded the carriage as Marlena, princess of the Vostaver Empire, was paraded through the streets. The cheering of her subjects was muted and soft, all but drowned out by the band and their triumphant and rapturous score. Marlena could not help but remember her mother talking about the crowds being so loud that the band seemed inaudible. Majesty. Luikin. Marlena gave him a harsh look. I'm right here. Talk to me. I will not have you rooting around in my mind as you please. Perhaps Her Majesty's subjects would take a little more heart if she showed a tad more interest in them. Out in the crowd, a child born on his father's shoulders waved. Marlena returned the wave with one of her own, as elegant and refined as she could manage. Yes, like that, Luikin said. Do not condescend to me, she grumbled. Such was not my intent, Luikin replied. He did not speak again for the remainder of the parade. Another hour passed in lackluster fanfare as they returned to the palace. They proceeded back in the same formation they had first taken to the carriage. Mistress Kianara and a small army of maids and palace servants awaited on the stairs as Luikin and Marlena exited the carriage, the former holding out his hand so that the latter could steady herself as she stepped down. In the proper ceremony, her mother would have been waiting at the palace entrance and the autarch would have offered his hand. So far we are from proper decorum, that a maid and an assassin must be in their places. The ocean of maids and servants parted, all stepping from the princess's path with the sole exception of Mistress Kianara, who entered the formation at Marlena's side, opposite from Luikin. The inner halls should have been host to wealthy merchants and high-ranking officers of the empire. Some had come, but they were few and far between. Most watched on in silence. Only a few clapped their hands as their princess passed. From many of the older ones she caught looks of disapproval. Pay them no mind, Highness, Mistress Kianara whispered. After that, Marlena kept her eyes fixed forward, gaze resolute and her head held high. Their path through the main halls ended at a pair of finely etched glass doors, the waves and patterns upon them so thick and numerous that it was impossible to see anything other than colors beyond. Two manservants opened and held the doors as Marlena and her procession passed. The interior gardens of the palace waited beyond, a massive courtyard of green built around a small arboretum. Flower beds gave color in hues of yellow, blue, red, and silver. A path wound through all of it, more merchants and autocrats and their families on both sides, all under the watch of a thin ribbon of palace guards on each side. Marlena took the winding path through the gardens and the arboretum. The autocrat and merchant families she passed through throwing flowers at her feet. Her mother had told her stories of the flowers at her coronation being so thick that she could not see the pavestones underfoot. She would be disappointed seeing this. 
Passing through the gardens, the procession came to the entrance to the Hall of Stars, marked by two cavernous doors and a platoon of guards. In the center of the yawning doorway stood first champion Cal Danarum and the other three remaining guardians, two on Cal's left and one on his right. Cal Danarum, first champion of the throne, was a tall and imposing man. Legend was that he had stopped aging in his fifties, that he had endured out of sheer strength and willpower. His features looked chiseled from weathered stone, one of his eyes sky blue and the other a fashioned orb of crystal glass set in a scar. And most importantly, Cal radiated authority and power. Slung on Cal's back was the great sword Nimura, a weapon of awesome potency. Marlena could feel the latent magic of the sword like a hum in the air, tingling her skin. Cal and the guardians with him exchanged places with Sayer and his men. Marlena would be escorted to her throne by her first champion. Cal moved with confidence and military precision, a pillar of strength leading her down the Hall of Stars. Of course, if he was that strong, Mother would still be here. The Hall of Stars was so named because of the mural of the night sky painted on the ceiling. Gemstones had been pressed where the stars were painted, glittering when darkness descended in the hall. The walls were lined with banners depicting various victories from the Empire's past. Soldiers stood beneath each of those banners, sons and daughters of the family lines that had produced heroes of the Empire. Many of those family lines kept a branch living in Edervas in order to honor the tradition. As a result, the Hall of Stars was properly crowded as it should have been. The far side of the hall was dominated by a massive golden relief, a dragon with ruby eyes standing vigil over the doorway that would connect to the throne room beyond. The procession passed through that doorway, through a hall with busts of Empress's past. A bust of Mother will be added here soon. Marlena felt a pang of grief at the idea of having to pass her own mother's face set in stone. And at long last, Princess Marlena Caldron was delivered to her throne room. The throne itself dominated the chamber, raised up on a dais and accessible by a flight of stairs as tall as the average man. Another shorter flight of stairs elevated the throne above the dais. Save for the champions of the throne and the fleet master Lon Schifern, all who stood upon the dais. The room was empty. Royalty from Erendar and Kethalon and Aeona, all who had attended her mother's coronation to promote peace with the Empire, were absent. Second champion May Alsharia held the Stone of Voss on a velvet cushion in front of her chest. She smiled warmly at Cal and Marlena as they entered. The guardians and Mistress Kianara broke from the formation to stand by the doorway. Marlena ascended onto the dais with Cal flanking her. May dropped to one knee as the princess set her first foot upon the dais, holding aloft the cushion with the stone of Voss. Marlena walked to the first foot of the second flight of stairs, then turned around. Cal Danarum picked up the stone and the three golden chains that held it. He placed the stone upon her head, arranged so that the brilliant sparkling gem hung on the center of her forehead. All Marlena could think was that her mother should have been the one to do it. But with so simple a gesture, a princess became an empress. She ascended the stairs to her throne. Every step was a battle, heralding a war against the world that had claimed the previous empress. Be it against the schemes of outsiders, the conspiracy of Louis Canifaris and whatever allies he claimed, or an alliance amongst the two groups and more, Marlena prepared for struggle as she reached the top, then sat down and smoothed her skirts. First champion Cal Danarum began reciting ceremonial rites that should have been spoken by the Autarch, but Marlena didn't hear the words. All she could think of was her empire, her vaunted champions, her prized assassin, and her peerless guardians. All of them, all of their strength, and all of it was for naught when it came to protecting her mother. A princess understood at long last. After sixteen years, Marlena came to realize that the weight of the Stone of Voss was nothing, but the crushing weight of being an empress was everything. It should have been a moment to define her life. But I never wanted to become empress like this. There was an overlook atop the small hill in the Arboretum that gave a view of a significant portion of the gardens. It had long ago become Cal Danarum's favorite place in the palace. 
there was a small paved area, complete with benches carved from stone, his preferred place to perch when in need of a moment of solitude. Today, though, Cal Danerum stood. First champion Cal Danerum stood and watched the aftermath of the coronation. It was, perhaps, the least impressive one he had seen in his lifetime. More than 300 years of duty hung heavy on him. He had stopped aging almost 250 years ago. Yet still, after the past week, Cal felt every second of his age. 53 years old, and it only took two and a half centuries to finally feel like an old man. Cal sighed, not able to shake the dejected look he'd seen in Empress Marlena's eyes. Thrones were thing that drank bloodlines. To see a girl not yet seventeen placed upon one. You should be a bit more optimistic, old friend. I'll not have you in my mind, Luigan. Cal glanced over one shoulder to see the assassin sitting on the Overlook's bench. You know my telepathy doesn't work like that, Luigan groaned. And I'm supposed to take the word of a telepath on that? Cal turned to face him with his arms crossed. When are you going to grasp that proving a negative is an impossible standard? It was, perhaps, the most exasperated Cal had ever seen the weekend. What, in the name of our magnificent empire, did I do to deserve this mistrust? Cal looked Luikin dead in the eyes, trying to ascertain whether the sincerity he saw was rehearsed or genuine. I believe the more bitter reality that none of us in the palace trust each other, and for good reason. Yes, yes, Luikin waved a hand dismissively. Rank, status, competition. And yet none of you are willing to set those aside to preserve the one thing they are in service of. Raising an eyebrow, Cal asked, And you are? I have to be, Luikin said bitterly. The rest of you might be caught in your own games of power, but I stand ready to defend this nation, and I will do so alone if I have to. Then why come to me? Because, Luikin replied, out of everyone else in this place, I know you would say the exact same and mean it. Luikin was right. Cal knew that Luikin knew he was right. Fine then. If it's an alliance you want, I know the best method for you to earn it. Earn it! Luikin snarled and turned to leave. Wait, please. To Cal's shock, Luikin chose to linger. There is one I need you to find, Cal said. If you can deliver him to me, we will have the strength we need to weather the coming storm. It will prove to me your trustworthiness and secure our strength in a single move. I'll dispatch a cruiser with a crew that I trust, Luikin answered. Now who are we trying to find? Echo Chian stood from where her back had been leaning against one of the garden columns. She opened her eyes and let her hearing return to normal. Eavesdropping on two men on the far side of the gardens had required all of her focus. She hadn't even been able to remain vanished while doing it. Fortunate for her, then, that she had stolen the garb of a menial palace servant. Menials are always overlooked. Reaching out along the soul-tethered bond that she held to her partner, she asked, You awake, White Raven? I am now, came the reply. Hungry, too. Chion sighed and rolled her eyes. Keep your appetite in check. Fine, fine. And get ready to fly. She stepped away from the pillar. We'll be chasing a cruiser soon. Why would she leave the palace? It's a target of opportunity, Chion replied. The Empress's movements are confined and predictable. Those of an important Imperial officer will not be. If that doesn't lure her out, then I don't know what will. Okay, I'll be ready to fly on your word. Thanks. Chion made a few more steps before light bent around her, and then she vanished. The reckoning was close at hand. <laughs>